as a child I had a strong interest in woodworking, but I was more interested in playing the violin, so I started to play the violin when I was 10, and um, then went through and I had a career as a violinist. I, I went to Eastman School of Music in Rochester and then Yale Graduate School and got my master's in music and then spent about 17 years in professional orchestras uh, before I decided I wanted a career change and um, my wife suggested that, well, what you've always been interested in violin making, why don't you try a summer course, do something, something different over the summer. I made a gradual transition from orchestra musician to violin maker and it, it took me four years. I studied with uh, a master maker and um, then uh, at, in 92 I took a year's leave from the orchestra which was the Baltimore Symphony and decided to do this full time. One thing that most people don't realize about violin makers who do it full time is that most of your work in a given year 60 to 80 percent of it is repair work. To put it uh, simply, they, they aren't low maintenance. When the weather changes, things dry out, they open up, they need to be re-glued, they get cracks, accidents happen, and so, uh, you know, as a violin maker, one of my main jobs is service to, you know, to other string players and people who need their instruments worked on. Um, now at this stage what I'm doing is I'm getting ready to put the first of the color coats on this uh, ground. But at this point what I have to do is I have to, I have to cut this down a little bit to remove any bubbles and remove a little bit of brush texture. So I have to sand this lightly. check it for smoothness. I run a Kleenex over it to see if I feel rough spots. So now I'm going to put the first coat of varnish on this back. And you can see, you can see what a beautiful color that is. How it, it gives transparency to this sort of um, this sort of almost opaque yellow. This is not the most skilled part of violin making, but um, it's one of the most important because you want it to look nice. Because um, appearance and aesthetics, when you look at something like a violin, they, they do matter. There's the, the first result. So you compare that with this. Well, tools and uh, violin making are a fascinating subject because a lot of violin makers today do use a lot of power tools. I primarily make a violin by hand and uh, uh, I still do, like for instance, the, the inlay, the purfling, I do that by hand. This groove is cut by hand and then the splinters are dug out and then you uh, glue purfling that fills this channel. Here's some other tools. This is an adjustable peg shaver. It works almost like a pencil sharpener. This is dubbed the world's smallest plane. Then there are, of course, there are, there are the larger tools like all the chisels and uh, rasps and files and some tools you have to make yourself. I, I, I make my own um, carving tools, which are made from old files. Um, and uh, because I like that file steel, it cuts really well. What I always tell people is there are good old instruments and there are bad old instruments, just the way there are good new ones and bad new ones. It just depends on what the maker did and how good he was.